My name is JJ Baskin, and um, all four of our speakers today are class of 88 Woo! and um, 25th anniversary. I want to thank Mary Kay from uh, Alumni. Um, we were kind of brainstorming on Facebook a couple of weeks ago and said, wouldn't it be cool if we did something that really annoyed our friends and woke them up very early in the morning? And, um, and so actually this is called the Tower 10, which is a really great idea of, wait, what time are we getting up in the morning? And, or uh, the other alternative is, just because they're not here doesn't mean they're not our friends, but if they are, they are the friends of the year. So thank you for, <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, there are four speakers this morning. We're, we're just literally taking 10 minutes just to tell a story of the things we're working on or the observations or the things in life. And, um, and two of us are going to be really good, and two of us are really not. Um, so you'll figure out which ones, which ones they are. Um, but, uh, so we're, but we're going to we're going to start with uh, with Shelley. Um, Shelley is um, um, is a former principal who is now uh, finished her her dur, so we can call her doctor, and uh, and and is going to talk to us about some of the things in education that we may not be talking about. Welcome, right. Shelley. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you all so much for getting up, and I. I think it's pretty cool to be back at Trinity talking about what I learned at Trinity, which is education. I was telling my husband, who is uh, here, he, he actually got up with me and came, uh, I was telling him that we were going to do these 10-minute uh, talks, and he said, how are they going to do that? And I said, well, I don't know, we're just going to each come up and do our thing for a few minutes. And he said, no, what I mean is, how are they going to get you to stop talking after 10 minutes? <laughs> To stop talking, that'd be great for me to use. <laughs> Two big issues that people are talking about in education right now are uh, Common Core, state standards, nod your head if you know what I'm talking about, and a uh, new teacher evaluation system all over the country. Uh, Common Core has been developed in, uh, or has been adopted in every state in the union except for Texas, way to hold out, Texas, right? <laughs> um, Nebraska, Alaska, and Virginia are also holdouts. Um, but in every other state, Common Core state standards are meant to kind of level the playing field. It's kind of the nation's answer to um, making sure that everybody's on the same page, in the same subjects, at the same grade. So conceivably, if you have a second grade child, you live in Florida and you have to move to North Dakota, uh, your second grade child can just pick up right where they left off albeit with a heavier coat um, when you go to North Dakota, um, and just be able to pick right up where they left off. That just happened to coincide with that little race to the top initiative that told uh, states you need to come up with a new teacher evaluation system. Um, and that has been, uh, it's been a little distracting, I think, for the nation to have those two big initiatives going on at the same time. The teacher evaluation systems is based on uh, student achievement scores and uh, like principal evaluation of the teacher and that is going into teacher pay so there's a little bit of dissension in the ranks um, folks are a little disturbed about that but what I want to talk about is the things that aren't being talked about around those issues what teachers unions are not saying um, is what we're doing and I work with Charlotte Danielson who is the developer of one of the main frameworks for teaching uh, that is the basis for evaluation systems in 26 of the states. And I get to go to those 26 states and talk to teachers about teacher effectiveness and also talk to principals about how to observe their teachers totally objectively. So I am thrilled to be able to do what I do. Um, and what I'm hearing teachers say, first and foremost, is accountability and assessment are not four-letter words. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the nation is kind of making it seem like that is the case, but teachers inherently don't have a problem with accountability and assessment any more than our kids have a problem with being held accountable. You might be sitting there saying, wait a minute, my child doesn't like rules anymore, <laughs> and I am here to say that kids crave it. Um, at my experience as a teacher, a counselor and an administrator for the last seven years, they want that. So like if we have a rule in the lunchroom that says when the lights go off, the voices get quiet, they want to know that's going to be enforced and it kind of disturbs them when it's not. Um, 
I also think that uh, going around the country and talking to uh, teachers, I talked to a principal in New York City last week, and he said to me, Shelly, I have a question. He said, I've got this problem. I've got a group of students who are not going to class. After lunch, fifth, sixth, and seventh period, they're just not going to class. And I said, well, where are they going? Are they going out and going to the local pizzeria, getting a slice of pizza? Because I'm thinking, new to this traveling thing, I'm really enjoying that. And he said, no, they're not leaving school. They're just hanging out in the stairwell or hanging out in the hallway. And I started cocking my head to the side like our Labrador retrievers do when they're trying to interpret what we're saying. And I said, I'm not sure I get that. Like, how, how would it work if you just went up to that group of students and said, hey, I know, you know, in the past you guys have been able to get away with that, but uh, from now on, you know, at Martin Van Buren High School, uh, kids with class go to class, so <laughs> let's go to class and, you know, walk them, walk them there. And he said, you know what, we haven't tried that. What they <laughs> Expectation. He just said it's become they become complacent, and they just said those kids hang out in the hallway. So let's change that and say here's what we expect. Kids don't mind that. <coughs> Teachers don't mind that. And uh, we did a whole bunch of training in New York City this summer. Seventy-five thousand. Did you all know? Seventy-five thousand teachers in New York City, this is the biggest district in the nation. And we were teaching 240 of them. And a gentleman. Uh, we, were to, we asked the question, what does student assessment have to do, or uh, keeping, keeping track of students' grades, have to do with their achievement? And he raised his hand, he walks over the microphone, and he goes, uh, hi, my name is Matt, and I'm a reformed, not good record keeper. And we all kind of said, hi, Matt. And, I <laughs> and he said, seriously, I am here to tell you that I used to not keep good records, didn't hold kids accountable. I, you know, take their grades and all that, but I wouldn't track their progress. And he said, and you guys taught us how to make kids do that for themselves. They keep track of their own records, and they start watching their progress, and it makes all the difference in the world. And um, that leads me to my second point, which is we just need to teach whatever it is we expect. We just need to make sure we teach that. So um, uh, my, the second point is that building skill level in teachers actually builds capacity in students. And I wholeheartedly believe this. If we want to build good questioning skills in our kids, we need to build that skill level in our teachers. Teach them how to ask those questioning skills so that it's not, so that I'm not the sage on the stage, but I'm the guide on the side, that I'm able to facilitate that learning among kids. And I think that is huge. My kindergarten teachers were rock stars at this when I taught, when I was the principal in elementary school in Niceville, Florida. They were rock stars at this. They were able to get their kindergartners doing this discussion thing between each other. And I think if we want that to happen, imagine if we teach that at the kindergarten level where somebody, you know, kid answers the question and another kid says, I like what Jared said, but I also think that blah, blah, blah. If we can foster that at kindergarten level and first grade teachers then foster it, second grade teachers then foster it, what happens when those kids get to third grade? What happens when they get to 12th grade? And I think what, what happens when they get to 12th grade is we're building a community where but that's what we want. We want people that can discuss things uh, professionally, respectfully, uh, rapport-filled instead of dissension in the ranks. And I started thinking, what would, what would our workplaces look like if we did that? What would Congress this week <laughs> look like if we did that? What, what would our world look like and how much better it would be? So that's what I do all over the country, go and talk about it. And I think my, my third point is that communication and trust are how we get there. And um, the communication and trust, I did my dissertation uh, last year. I, I should say Dave and I did my dissertation. <laughs> when you do a dissertation, your uh, spouse really does it with you. Um, I did my dissertation on teacher trust and principals. I wanted to know, do teachers trust the principals in their schools? And if they do or if they don't, what are the builders or barriers to that trust? Not surprisingly, teachers were not reluctant to share with me. Um, they were not reticent in the least about uh, why they trust their principal or why they don't. And the number one thing they said was communication is the factor. Tell us what's going on. And I don't mind if you tell me 
some things about my teaching that you saw when you were in my classroom, but can you do it respectfully? And I think that is huge. I think that's something that we need to work on a lot more. I say it's not what you say, it's how you say it. In fact, my, my book, I wrote a book called Communicate and Motivate, but I wanted the title to be, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, because isn't that really what it's all about? You know, that uh, I had a, a principal in upstate New York who said to us while we were watching a video, we were training them how to do observation skills, and the principal said, when do we get to tell the teacher that their lesson sucked? <laughs> I sat there and I, here's what I wanted to say right after you wash your mouth, that was it. <laughs> but what I said was to the whole group, how would the conversation with teachers change if we invite them to communicate about their teaching instead of telling them, look, here's what you need to do. We get so caught up, I think, sometimes in our own rightness that we forget there's another person, a human being, sitting there with us, and that we need to do this, build this communication. Teachers are inherently not opposed to hearing what's going on, but let's have a conversation where teacher evaluation is done with teachers and not done to teachers. So I'm a big proponent of that, and I think perhaps that is more than more about, uh, or more than the elephant in the classroom, it's really about the elephant in the room of any relationship. At the end of a blog that I write, at the end of every blog, I say, uh, just for today, perhaps we can blah, 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 you know, whatever the advice is. And I'll end with this. Perhaps for today, just for today, perhaps we can focus on accountability, accountability and assessment in a way that invites teachers to be a part of that conversation instead of being apart <laughs> from the conversation. And I say happy community to you all. Thanks for letting me be here. Um, I, I live in Austin, and, um, and I'm a geek, and, I, uh, and I'm also a policy monk, and I ended up going to grad school at the LBJ School uh, uh, of Public Affairs, and, um, which frankly was one of the ways I, that I wanted to be fed in terms of finding out more information about politics and, and things like that. And I'm not sure I would have ever gone to grad school if we had what we have on the internet today. If we had blogs that we had and things like that, and frankly, one of the best in the state, and Frankly, one of the best in the nation is our own Charles Cuffer. He writes off the cuff. It's been around for uh, 12 years now, and uh, about a thousand people a day go to this event. And um, and what's remarkable about it is one, um, he's not making the big bucks off of this, but two, um, it the level of detail and rigor that he does in breaking down elections, or talking about other things, or talking about the dynamics of things. Um, even with a particular political slant, is is respected by all sides, and uh, I'm thrilled you're here, Charles, and 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 uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Gary. You'll have to trust that my name is Charles Guffin. I haven't been to Northrop yet to get my name. Um, somebody once asked me what it's like to be one of the considered one of the best political bloggers in Texas, and I said, well. It's a little like being considered one of the best shortstops in Albania. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice and all, but it's really only of interest to the true aficionados. Um, you know, it, it's kind of funny that I, that I got into this because I studiously avoided classes at Trinity that required writing a lot of papers. I was a math major, and I kind of preferred, I kind of preferred my daily work in limited doses, uh, where, I, where, I knew, where I knew where the starting and end points were, um, but I did write for the Trinitonian, for a sports column, and uh, the same name. And um, I, I turned out that I kind of liked that. And after graduating, I, you know, I, I, I missed it. I didn't have an outlet for it. And um, you know, I was on Usenet a million years ago, back when that was a thing. And I was on some um, email lists, and I, I sometimes write stuff about you know travel or whatever. And I mean, all that stuff was lost to me. I mean, I, I, I wrote some I wrote some great travel stories from 
in like 95 on, you know, on an email system that doesn't exist anymore for a company I don't work for and a laptop I don't own. So <laughs> I, 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 I missed having an out, I, I didn't just miss having an outlet, I missed having a way of actually keeping track of what I wrote. And so one day when I happened to be surfing the internet and I stumbled across a blog written by a friend of mine, and I looked at it and I'm like, that, that's what I want. <laughs> and she helped me get it set up and I went off from there. And honestly, I thought I was going to write about sports because that's what I'd written about before. And it turned out that politics was more interesting to me. Who knew? <laughs> um, you know, 2002 was kind of, I mean, in, in terms of, you know, blogging, 2002 was basically the, the uh, Jurassic period. I mean, it, that, that's a long time ago. But when I started out, at the time, I mean, this was, you know, I mean, a lot of people started blogging kind of in the aftermath of 9-11 and the start of the, and the lead up to the Iraq war. Um, and one of the things I observed early on was there were an awful lot of people talking about national and international stuff, which A, didn't interest me very much, B, I didn't know anything about, and C, I figured, how am I ever going to, you know, establish myself in a market that's already pretty saturated? And I realized that I, there wasn't anybody writing about stuff happening in my own backyard. And that led me into focusing on local and state politics. <laughs> and, you know, it's been, it's been a really interesting journey with that. Um, I'm considered part of the media landscape in Houston now, which has had a number of interesting effects. Um, occasionally invited to be on radio and TV. I prefer radio because I don't have to wear a tie for that. Um, you know, people sometimes ask me about whether what I do is journalism, and you know that that's another debate that played out a long time ago in, in the blind world, and it's it's tedious and unnecessary. No, I'm not a journalist. I occasionally do journalistic type things. I mean, I, I have on occasion I've been the first person to report something. I do original work in interviewing candidates and, as JJ says, analyzing elections, stuff that you really wouldn't see anywhere else. But, you know, if the Houston Chronicle went out of business tomorrow, I, I, I'd lose about 75% of what I write about. I mean, what I do is based on other people's work. It's commentary, it's analysis, and to some extent, it's like an executive clipping service. Um, but people, you know, people tell me they find it useful, they like it. Um, I can't tell you how many people have told me that they went you know, to research you know, a local election or some other news topic and they stumble across something I've written. Um, you know, and they find it useful. And that, that's, I, I, I like that. You know? I, mean, I have to admit, when I, when I wrote for the paper and someone would come and tell me that they liked a column I wrote, it's a big ego boost, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the, the one, the one award I got in college that I'm still proud of to this day is that I got an award for best sports column by a small college newspaper. It's like, hey, that's pretty cool, you know? Um, being, in the, being considered a media person means that sometimes people think I have, think I have expertise in things, and that, that's one part amusing, one part occasionally intimidating. I mean, that's, that's how I sometimes wind up being invited to be on television or on the radio. Um, I have opinions, sure. <laughs> I'm happy to give them to you. But it's like, you know, I don't, I mean, I wasn't a political science major. Um, I, didn't even, I didn't go to school in Texas, so I didn't take the Texas history class that anyone who went to school here did that my daughters will take. Um, when I, I mean, it's, it, I look back on some of the old stuff that I wrote, and it's kind of funny because it's like, I didn't have any idea what the hell I was talking about. But there I was, <laughs> out on the internet for anyone to see, um, you know, and you know, the fact that I have it all archived is, is both still good and that it reminds me of that and kind of appalling sometimes. Um, I have, you know, one of the one of the experiences that I had as a result of this, the, the local PBS day, the local PBS uh, loves me. I've been, I've been a guest on, on different shows for them. Uh, I was invited one day to be a, on a panel show uh, at, the, at, at which my opposite number, if you will, was uh, State Senator Dan Patrick, if you're in 
Texas, you know, he's now running for lieutenant governor, and um, he's a lot less liberal than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and there were actually three people on this panel, but, and it was, it was a half hour show, and the way they do it is they, they bring you in, you know, and you literally just film straight through, and half an hour later you're out. Um, and the third guy, the poor guy, he never got a word in it. <laughs> two of us, the whole time. <laughs> I, have to, I apologize to him afterwards because he truly never got a word in. Um, one of the, my wife, um, Tiffany, um, she kept her name. And, you know, she works, she works in the oil industry. She is the uh, chairman of the board, the local lower organic food co-op. Um, so she has, I mean, she, you know, she has a large network of people she knows professionally and through her own interests. And because she kept her name, people sometimes will know her for a long time before they realize that she and I are married. You know, if they don't happen to see us together, and more than on more than one occasion, um, someone that she's been talking with is someone who knows me well sometimes personally, but often through the blog, and one day the light bulb will go on, and they'll say, oh my god, you're married to Kaf. <laughs> um, so, what do, why do I do what I do? Well, that's a good question. I mean, Shelley was talking about uh, getting her doctorate, and uh, one, of my, um, one of my sweet mates at Trinity, David Rake, of the three of us that were math majors he was, and, and went to graduate school in math, he was the only one that actually finished it. And he once said that uh, getting a PhD is, is really an exercise in bloody-mindedness. Um, and to a certain extent, that's what, what I do is the same thing. Um, I know an awful lot of people who started blogs and they've come and ask me for advice about it. And what I say to them is, you know, it's really easy to start a blog. They're free. You know, the software is very user-friendly. Um, the hard part is doing it on a regular basis, coming up with something to say, something that you are interested in, that other people actually want to read. Um, and I've seen an awful lot of them, they go at it great for a few weeks or a few months and then it just disappears. And this is, as much as anything for me, it's, you know, it, it's kind of a passion. And that's a little weird for me to say because I don't usually, you know, I, I don't usually talk about things that way. But it's something I care about, um, and you know, JJ's right. I, I don't I don't run ads. I don't get paid for this. It takes it takes up a reasonable amount of my time. Um, I do it because I like it because I feel like I get value out of it. I do it because people I know and respect say to me, I I, I like what you're doing. It, it helps me stay informed. I do it because you know, someday I can look back and say. You know, I don't know whatever else I did in life, but I left something behind. Um, and I really feel like I get something out of it. Um, I, I tell people that I'm a much better citizen now because I do this. I, I pay attention to what's going on. Um, I, I understood all you were talking about with education reform, the teacher evaluation, and the Common Core. I, I, I knew that Texas was one of the states that didn't adopt it. Um, I, it it's, it's helped me as much as anything. And um, I, I really appreciate that. I, I appreciate every day that people actually read it because, to be honest, I, I write it primarily for myself. Um, and that, that was how I did the sports column, too. It's like, if, if, it, if it interests me enough to write about it, that's good enough. And if someone else likes it, that's a bonus. So I want to thank you all for, for being here and for listening to me to ramble on about it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all later today. Thank you very much. It is great to be here. I, I, I appreciate people who got up, especially, you know, Lisa Kaiser Gork, who I lived at the Trinity, and um, people often make the assumption that I was this dyed-in-the-wool sports fan. Oh my god, I have to go work for a sports team, as many people who came behind me wanted to work in the, in the area that I was. And in fact, the case is that, picture this, I am in New Orleans, Macy's is on my left, the Superdome is on my right, I'm with a bunch of 
inebriated legislators from Missouri who we were trying to get a stadium for so we could actually attract a new team back to St. Louis after the Cardinals left in 1987. And I remember reading the headlines when I was here at Trinity and never knew the irony of all that. And um, on the left uh, is the shopping, on the right is my first potential professional football game. This is a Super Bowl, okay? So I'm like, yeah, well, I'm a dutiful employee, so of course I'm going to go to the Super Bowl. But uh, my first professional game being the Super Bowl is really something that you don't really share with a lot of people until a lot later because it would be very embarrassing to say that you had never been to a Super Bowl game. So fast forward 10 years, 1990 was that game, 2000 was uh, the game that I had the opportunity to be with the team that I helped to relocate while I was at Fleischmann Hiller Public Relations in St. Louis, the Los Angeles Rams had the opportunity to then move to St. Louis. Ten years later, I was with the team that I worked for directly and had the opportunity to be part of a winning Super Bowl team and got a Super Bowl ring from the owner of the Rams, the late owner of the Rams. Um, what I want to talk to you guys about today is that collecting experience is key. Trinity is a, a key point in just sort of being able to figure out where do you open up to figure out what the opportunities are. I never took a communications class, and I ended up in communications. You never took a writing class, you were a math guy. I was a political science major. All of these things sort of connect to make the opportunities that we have. So being a collector of experiences and being able to just be a liberal arts major and say, huh, my boss is telling me he wants me to go to the Frank Lloyd Wright House in Springfield, Illinois with the owner of the Los Angeles Rams, early 90s. I'm billing 16 hours a day. You want me to get on a party bus with, with these random people from Los Angeles, the owner, the significant other with the ponytail, the PR guy who turns out is now married to the literary agent that Shelly is courting in Arizona. So the connections are, are weird here. And so I get on this party bus and apparently didn't make a bad impression, had a good day, went to the Frank Lloyd Wright House, the Dana Common House in Springfield, Illinois, and fast forward three years later, I get the call, they're like, we're so glad you're still there. This is the owner of the team saying, we're going to move to St. Louis, and we are glad that you're still part of this, this whole thing. And so through those experiences of just saying, okay, I'm along for the journey. I don't know where the journey's going to take me. I'm going to keep my mouth shut because I don't have any idea what I'm doing here. Um, I came from a public relations communications background right into uh, the opportunity to work for a sports team. So to me, that sort of Rodan quote, which is, nothing is a waste of time if you use the experience wisely, is really an important one. And as I have kids who are now in high school and still in elementary school, I'm always telling them that, you know, you don't know what this experience is going to be for you, but if you just kind of open yourself up and try it, you just never know what's going to ignite you. So you talked about passion. What's the passion? What's the thing that you love to do? And how do you get that opportunity? It's by collecting those experiences and being the person who says, all right, I'll take it. Well, we all know that. We came to Trinity. The liberal arts education opens you up to whatever it is that you're going to do. You never know. And I'm amazed by how people just have such different experiences here, but then build upon them and then network with people and create a wonderful network. So to me, that's what this educational process has been. And it got me to where I was. I mean, I wouldn't have, I wasn't, I didn't make the goal. I was talking to Lisa Petrovich last night. She's like, I wanted to be a sports writer. I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. And then I realized I wasn't going to be able to do that. And she was one of those people who really was interested in that kind of career. And I always look at, there's such an irony to, to what it is that we, that we end up doing. So when I, when I think about some of the things that, uh, I, was telling, I was telling another story last night, and <coughs> it's these experiences where you, you go through and you never know where they're going to take you. I thought, you know, I'm going to go work in public relations. I don't even have a degree in communications. And then I start teaching a class. And I realized that all the things I've learned in the real world was what I really needed to know. And so the opportunity to, have, you know, to be in an, in an environment like this has been really helpful. I do some work in the education field now, and I think that communication is the thread that sort of takes you through everything. And it really is interesting how much communication was part of these conversations. And so I look at that and say, that, that's, that's just such an, that's such an important piece. So I think collecting experiences Knowing that connections are non-linear, 
I like what Cheryl Sandberg said in her book, it's not a corporate ladder, it's a corporate jungle gym, or it's a jungle gym, it doesn't have to be corporate, because you're gonna go on different little paths along the way, and you never know where you're gonna go. And you know, I think goals are a little overrated. Sometimes it's hard to say that to your high school, or you know, mom, you can't, goals are overrated, is that being a good role model? And I said, well, here's what I mean by that. What I mean is that, you know, you can set some, some, some goals generally, but you need to be open because if you're inflexible, you're not, you're, you're not gonna have that opportunity. So I say when the opportunity knocks, you open the door and be open to the experience and have an opportunity. And that, I think, is really what Trinity helped me do to get a Super Bowl ring, to have the opportunity to do something that I never would have dreamed that I could do, and I had moved on to start my own business in communications, and just recently wrote a book with basic sports terminology. It's called Talking a Good Game, and it's just the basics of sports. You know, in business, you walk in every day and people are talking about sports, and if you don't really know what's going on, it's a little, it can be a little awkward. So I say just have a couple headlines in your back pocket, and you're good. <laughs> and, and, and you don't need to know everything, because I could be your testament. Just be a quick study, and roll with it. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks for getting up this early. All the Spurs that I was with at Tycoon Flats last night, they were not there. I'd love to be there. But <coughs> for all of you, who, if you do actually watch this, it was great to see everybody. Thanks so much. <laughs>
um, your liability goes up dramatically. <laughs> um, so they just eliminated birthdays in general, I think, at, at, uh, at Trinity. Um, the, uh, the, the, the second thing that's really changed um, since we graduated is really the student experience. Um, this upcoming year, they're changing the curriculum for the first time since 1986. The common curriculum has been in place, and, um, and now they are readjusting that. And that's appropriate, and, um, but, and it's very lasting that that, that, that particular curriculum uh, stay in place. But there are um, some other things that have changed as well. I don't know if you remember, uh, uh, for class of 88, our convocation, initial one as freshmen, um, Lowell Cake, who was vice president of the Student Association, stood up and said, when I entered Trinity, we were the smartest class in the history of Trinity University. And then my sophomore year, we were the second smartest class in the history of Trinity <laughs> University. And then third, and now y'all are here, and he says, as I project this out, we will, on the evolutionary scale, be, you know, amoeba compared to who will be, who will be there. Um, and in some ways, we kind of had this projection of, uh, of that. And in also, our greatest year in terms of recognition and, uh, was our freshman year, uh, because that was the year we were the smartest, and then in came the classes after us. Um, but there are some significant changes that uh, we're just as smart um, but we are, um, I would say there's probably uh, two major differences. One is the difference of diversity. We're almost 30% um, uh, ethnically diverse. We have um, an Asian Student Association. Uh, there's, a, there's actually a, a large group of Vietnamese students that go here. There, there's a student that I, a former student I mentor, who's a first generation college grad whose father was bailed out of jail. Uh, in Vietnam, with um, uh, by they selling everything they had, and they moved uh, to the United States, and she was the first to have the opportunity and graduated from Trinity University. So sometimes a great university is known by its students, sometimes it's known by its graduates, sometimes it's known by the stories that it tells. And the fact that we are now, we've gone from 7%, I believe, and so correct me, to almost 18 or 19% Pell eligible. Which means Pell eligible. It means that there's there's uh, there's you're hitting a certain level of d disposable income where there isn't, and so in order to go to college, you need to be eligible for some federal dollars, and so from us to go to double that amount in a very short period of time is really remarkable. President um, Albert is um, is a first generation college grad, and he is actually one of the nation's or the world's premier experts on the economics of education, and he's incredibly dedicated to making sure that. We are not just a place that educates, but that we are a place that is helping to transform lives. Um, and I think that's fantastic. While we are less concerned by moving the fountain, less concerned with the outside and the outside deal, I think we are much more concerned about outside of Trinity. Um, we were just starting out when we were, we were a class, the first time we had a Martin Luther King Day, the first time that we were sort of two back and volunteers were volunteering off campus, there's now a dorm dedicated to service. The service learning is a massive part of the educational experience at Trinity. And uh, our you know, President Albert was on the SA 2020 board with, uh, uh, with Mayor Castro as they thought about what does the San Antonio of the future look like. And some of our own Trinity graduates created the fastest growing company in Texas with Rackspace. And so there are actually people, opportunities to stay here in San Antonio upon graduation. So there's a, there's a, there's a major change in diversity and the opportunity that is really, I think, um, uh, rather significant and, and frankly pretty exciting. And I'm, I'm very proud to, uh, to see that. Um, there's also one of the five things is something happened that we never thought would happen. Um, and so I'm going to let y'all vote on which one this is because it's a little presumptuous of me to say what we never thought would happen. The first is, the uh, first option is they demolished our labels, um, which I never thought would happen, and, and, but they did. The second is that President Calgary quit smoking, <laughs> which was huge. I, if any of you ever met President Calgary when he was here, you could always tell how angry he was by, I, there was one time I, and I was good at irritating people, and still I, but particularly then, he had two cigarettes lit at the same time. And his head was just beat red. Um, but he quit smoking, and, and, and which really uh, I never thought would happen. But the third one is that Trinity University had the greatest play ever in the history of the world. And so in 2007, the Miracle of Mississippi happened, and, and we got the play of the year. And, um, and I was at the Rams at the 
time, and I mean, spiral around the office. It was impressive. It, my, my boss was for Yale. He's like, I think you went there. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Today I did. <laughs> well, the little known secret is it was a design play. <laughs> so 15 levels, we practiced it for an hour every day, and then we practiced making it look improvised. So that's the skill that you only find at Trinity University. So just out of curiosity, who thinks that of the three is the thing we never thought would happen? That you would have a All right. Um, the, the, the fourth one, I think, is that we said goodbye. The biggest changes that happened, and when I think of, there, there's three different goodbyes we've said. We said goodbye to people who retired, like Francis Swinney and Raymond Judd, and um, and what's reassuring is when we lose icons, they're replaced with incredible people as well. My friend Stephen Nichol, who's chaplain here now, has joined us this morning, and, and that's very reassuring um, that although we lose some of these legends that we so associate and brand with, we replace them with wonderful people as well. We've also lost some people that have moved. They've been, Char Miller is now at a different university. Who would have ever thought? I mean, I, I so identified Trinity with that. And then, of course, we said goodbye in many ways. And the ones that I think of, and there are other ones that you'll think of, but Dr. Everett, yeah. Hal Barger, Ozzy White, Russ Gossage, all passed away. It's um, kind of hard to come back and think of classes you've had and people you identify with that aren't necessarily here. But it's reassuring that uh, there, are, there are quality folks giving that same quality experience to, to other folks as well. Um, and I, I uh, when I... Uh, when I think of um, those that, that um, uh, I had the opportunity to go to Everett's and Barger's services and was so struck by A, how far people traveled to come and say goodbye, but B, how close so many of the faculty were to those people. It was really remarkable. Um, so, and then the fifth thing that's happened, and this really isn't the biggest change for Trinity in, per se, but this is the biggest change for me, and that is that um, I said hello again. And um, it, I know there are a lot of people who say they just graduated and they start getting the Trinity phone upon things. Say, I'm student debt, what I don't, don't bother me about that. And I, I really wasn't one of those, but and I came back and visited. But um, the big change that's kind of happened for me is that um, I want my kids to go here now. And there have been some remarkable <coughs> things that have happened. There's also been some strife and there been some challenges. You know, we all uh, followed some, somewhat of the, the challenges of the, uh, of the fraternities and sororities a couple years ago, but out of that, there was a growth opportunity and it's stronger for it. Um, but there are moments that happen. And I'm gonna share, Stephen, if I could, my, my niece came to visit Trinity four years ago when she was looking at colleges. And Stephen Nichol and John Donahue came and went to lunch with us. And, um, and Stephen turns to my niece and he says, Joni, um, I have a belief that there is no one person for you to marry in life. That there's not one magical person that you are going to meet in the course of your life. Six, seven, eight, maybe a dozen people that you could marry and be happy for the rest of your life. It's just when you meet them, if they're ready, and at that moment. He says, and I believe the same thing about colleges. I believe the same thing about colleges in that, that there are plenty of places you're going to be happy and you would thrive as a student. So enjoy the search, enjoy the journey of finding those. And you see this senior in high school literally feels that the weight of the world was lifted off her shoulders and she just takes a deep breath and smiles. And I thank you for that student. I think that the other thing that was so significant about that to me was we weren't selling Trinity, we were selling what's, if this is best for you, then we'll be, then please join this community. And that really, uh, I thought, was a, um, was a breakthrough to, to kind of hear from Trinity from kind of more of a hard sell to we are a great place for great people, and we hope that if you feel like we're the right match, that you'll come here. And I know that so many of you are right match for this place, and it's so good to see you uh, at this reunion, and I thank you for joining us for our TED 10 today, our t trendy Tower 10 today. <coughs> and uh, Mary Kay, again, thank you wherever Mary Kay is. Thank you all for allowing us to do this, and thank you all for rising at this early hour. And uh, we hope you have a great alumni weekend.